J. Marion Sims. This American physician was probably just a pure psychopath because he actually believed that black people didn't experience pain like white people. This guy literally just interned with a doctor and after just three months he started treating people and performing surgeries. Well, that didn't go well at all because he killed his first two patients and after this he decided to relocate for a fresh start. Yeah. Right. It was in Montgomery that Sims built his reputation amongst the rich white plantation owners by treating their enslaved workers. He started experimenting on black women who had a vesicovaginal fistula, which is an abnormal opening between the bladder and vagina that results in continuous peeing. The only treatment for this condition was surgery, so of course Sims started performing surgery on them with no experience and nothing to numb the pain. The women would endure hours of torture and pain while other doctors watched. Well, his surgeries were a huge fail for a long time, but after performing 30 different surgeries, including a 17-year-old enslaved woman who had a very atraumatic labor and delivery, he finally perfected his method. Afterward, he began to practice on white women using anesthesia while still refusing to use it on black patients. Sims also experimented on enslaved black children in an effort to treat neonatal tetanus with no success. He actually believed that African Americans were less intelligent than white people and thought it was because their skulls grew too quickly around their brains and would operate on the children using a shoemaker's tool to pry their bones apart and loosen their skulls. In the end, karma caught up with him and he ended up having the same fate as patients he tested his ideas on after having a heart attack. Dead. Ilya Ivanovich Ivanov. In science, there's always that funny line between genius and, well, weird. Russian biologist Ilya Ivanovich Ivanov wasn't afraid to push boundaries and slightly dip his toes to the odd side. You see, Ivanov wasn't your typical biologist. No sir, he was like a mad scientist straight out of a cartoon playing God with animal DNA like a game of genetic scrabble. Imagine this, Ivanov armed with a syringe and a dream decided it was a brilliant idea to mix and match animal bits like a kid at a candy store. Donkey sperm in a zebra? Check. Cow juice in a bison? You betcha. Guinea pig meets rabbit? Why not? It's like Noah's Ark had a wild frat party. But Ivanov didn't stop there. He had bigger and weirder plans brewing in his head, and as his fame grew, so too did his ambition. He set his sights on the ultimate genetic mashup, humans and apes. Yep, you heard that right. He wanted to bring Planet of the Apes to life, minus the Hollywood budget. So he snatched up some unsuspecting chimps and decided, hey, why not inject them with human stuff? He even had the audacity to try and recruit women for some unholy hybrid experiment under the guise of a medical examination. Talk about crossing the line from science to sci-fi. Thankfully, the French government swooped in like the cavalry in a B-movie, slamming the brakes on Ivanov's monkey business before things got too out of hand. And so Ivanov's dream of a real-life ape uprising were squashed like a bug under a microscope. It turns out that even the craziest ideas have their limits, and thank goodness for that. Giovanni Aldini. It was the 1700s, and like everything else back then, electricity had just hit the scene and everyone was buzzing with excitement. Forget fancy gadgets, the fact that a little glass bulb could light up without fire was practically magic. You'd think this would be enough to keep everybody busy, but no. Enter Giovanni Aldini, the mad scientist who wanted more. He wanted to know how electricity would affect living things. Needless to say, he got to work fast. Giovanni was like the rock star scientist of his time, touring Europe and showing off the wonders of the newly invented electricity by shocking humans and animals. It was the 18th century version of a rock concert, except instead of guitars, there were electrodes. He would find newly dead corpses, string them up on a board, and apply electrical shocks to their faces. This gruesome show made jaws contract, muscles convulse, and sometimes an eye even pop open. He was basically trying to prove that electricity could stimulate the dead. Because, you know, being dead wasn't punishment enough. Before long, he progressed to electrocuting living people and animals. If you were one of the unlucky ones, he'd attach electric nodes to your head just to see how you'd react. Ethics weren't exactly a 
thing back then, so Aldini went wild with his electric jolts like a kid in a candy store, but with more screaming and less sugar. Despite his shocking behavior, pun intended, Aldini's experiments paid off. He discovered that electric therapy could actually be helpful for mentally ill patients because electrical jolts stimulate certain parts of their brains positively. So while Aldini's methods were a bit electrifying, he did pave the way for future advancements in medical treatment. And hey, he taught us all an important lesson. Always read the terms and conditions before agreeing to a scientific demonstration. Paracelsus. If you've ever dreamt of having your own identical mini-me, good news. According to a scientist named Paracelsus, you don't even have to go to a special lab that would give you painful injections, collect your cells, and all your life savings. All you needed was a fancy incubator, some blood, heat, and healthy semen. Forget romantic nights, you were now a one-person baby factory. Paracelsus, a botanist born in 1493, believed there was no need to create life in the bedroom. He was convinced that every sperm cell contained a tiny, fully formed man just waiting for the right temperature to burst out. Think of it like hatching a human egg, but way weirder. And with no microscopes around, people actually believed Paracelsus when he said humans could hatch like eggs. Who needs biology class when you've got a wild imagination? However, aside from his bizarre theories about birth, Paracelsus was actually a brilliant scientist who pioneered the introduction of chemistry into medicine. He believed everything on Earth had some poison in it and started experimenting with poisonous minerals and chemicals to treat diseases. If you had syphilis back then, Paracelsus would give you a very small dose of mercury, and if you had digestive problems, he might prescribe antimony or zinc oxide. And guess what? Those treatments actually worked. Before him, doctors were stuck using only plants, herbs, or leeches for every illness. Thanks to Paracelsus, medicine took a giant leap forward, making us all grateful that he thought outside the box and the bedroom. Jose Manuel Delgado. Mind controlling your dad to take you to Disney World or mind controlling your maths teacher to give you the highest grade possible crossed your mind at one point in your life, but unlike you, a scientist named Jose Delgado had every plan to make his dream a reality and believed that electricity was the key to mind control. He got to work and soon created a microchip brain implant that could stimulate any animal's brain tissue. Then he connected the microchip to a special remote, kind of like a puppet master pulling the strings, but this time with a chip and remote. Jose first tested his invention on monkeys, and it worked perfectly. He was able to control the monkeys' movements and reactions. Delgado decided to take it up a notch, so he locked himself in a ring with a snorting, charging, angry bull, all while holding his trusty brain control remote. Surprisingly, with just a zap and click, Delgado stopped the bull in its tracks. He could not only draw out specific emotions from them, but he could also cause certain physical reactions. Talk about a showman scientist. Delgado's success made him a bit cocky, and he started envisioning himself controlling entire armies with his remote. Luckily, Delgado's new dreams never materialized for the soldiers who wanted to remain remote free. However, when he did some work at a mental hospital in Rhode Island, he chose patients who were seriously ill with epilepsy or schizophrenia whose disorders had resisted all other treatment. He implanted electrodes in 25 of them to study how he could use them to stop panic attacks, seizures, and other disorders controlled by specific signals within the brain. He passed away in 1963, leaving a legacy of fascinating yet ethically questionable experiments. Robert G. Heath. Well, according to the 17th century scientist Robert G., you didn't need a partner to give you sexual pleasure because everything you needed was already in your brain, and all you had had to do was unlock it. And what was the key? Why, electricity, of course. Robert actually believed he could unlock and tap into the part of your brain that gives you pleasure with electrical charges. Robert would start his Pleasure Palace experience by connecting some electrical nodes directly into the brains of his patient. The nodes would then deliver a certain chemical called acetylcholine, which was the secret ingredient responsible for the multiple orgasms that lasted for a whopping half hour. Well, there was a flip side to this procedure because if the nodes get connected to the wrong brain bits, then you're in for a world of pain instead, as more than one of his unfortunate participants discovered. Well, at least they experienced an intense emotion, right? While his research wasn't exactly textbook 
perfect, Robert managed to prove that deep brain stimulation was a useful tool in treating patients with movement disorders, Parkinson's disease, and epilepsy because it would cause them to experience intense pleasure and ease as the electrodes stimulated their brain. Carney Landis. It's a chilly Sunday evening, so you decide to stroll around campus. Suddenly you notice a weird-looking guy following your every move. When you tell your friends about this campus creeper, they all nod in agreement because he's been stalking them, too. Meet Carney Landis, the original campus creeper of 1924. Carney, a psychology student, wanted to find out if everyone made the same facial expressions when they were scared, ashamed, or in pain. But instead of just asking people to complete surveys or ask them questions, Carney took a more hands-on approach and decided to go full-on stalker mode. He somehow convinced some of his classmates to join his social experiment, which they soon regretted when Carney started doing crazy stuff to scare the pants off them. He'd randomly throw live frogs or freezing water at them, capturing their horrified expressions. Sometimes he'd even zap them with electrical jolts because nothing says research like a bit of electrocution. When these stunts didn't produce the dramatic reactions he hoped for, Carney pushed the limits by asking participants to behead a live rat in front of everyone. If you refused, Carney would grab your rat, behead it himself, and then snap a picture of your shocked face. Despite his wildly unethical methods, Carney's studies shed light on human emotions. People realized that everyone responds differently to pain, grief, or fear. So while his approach was more horror movie than scientific study, it did help advance our understanding of emotional reactions. In the end, we learned a valuable lesson. If a guy named Carney asks you to join a social experiment, just say no and walk the other way. If you want to find out more about all the crazy things scientists did, then you should join our Discord channel, Stubbins Firth. In 1793, if you were among the unlucky thousands who contracted yellow fever, your chances of survival were about as good as a snowball's chance in a bonfire. With no cure in sight and a lot of confusion about how to tackle this new plague, people assumed it was contagious and steered clear of anyone who even sneezed funny. But Stubbins Firth did not believe yellow fever was contagious and was ready to go to stomach churn lengths to do so. He theorized that because the sickness dropped off in winter, it was more likely caused by heat. Stubbins' obsession with yellow fever led him to take some truly wild steps. He started by making dogs and cats drink vomit from yellow fever patients, which didn't prove much because some animals died and some didn't, like a twisted version of Russian roulette. Frustrated by the lack of clear results, Stubbins decided to become his own guinea pig. Armed with only a trusty blade and his constant desire to find the truth, Firth first sliced open his arms and smeared vomit from yellow fever patients into the wounds. When that made no difference, he poured the vomit in his eye, drank some of the vile liquid, fried the stuff, breathed in the fumes, and, in a final act of madness, covered himself with urine, blood, and saliva from infected patients. The guy actually never got sick, but we know now that it was just because he was taking samples from late-stage patients who had passed the point of contagion. In other words, Firth was swallowing infected vomit and blood for absolutely no reason. So next time you try to find the cause and cure of diseases, leave vomit out of it. Sergei Brunkonenko. Now, experimenting with animals to find out what works best for humans has always been the order of the day in medicine, but when those experiments become cruel, then something is definitely wrong. Soviet scientist Sergei Brunkonenko, who is credited for helping the advancements in Russian open-heart surgery, performed experiments on animals that were extremely disturbing. Not one to wait, he wasn't content with slicing up animals after they died. In fact, he didn't even like the animals to die, even after they'd been decapitated. One time in the late 1930s, Brunkonenko and his team experimented on a dog. In this experiment, they literally cut off the dog's head, but managed to keep the severed head alive by attaching it to a machine called the autojector. The autojector was an apparatus designed to mimic the functions of the heart and lungs. The severed dog head responded to light sounds and even allegedly ate a piece of cheese, all without a body before 
before supposedly dying hours later. Well, it was already dead, but you get the idea. In another cruel experiment, he and his team removed the heart of a dog instead and connected its circulatory system to the machine to sustain the dog's heart artificially. Sometimes he performed experiments with deep hypothermia using the autojector device. The dogs were cooled down to a freezing point, but just before they die, Runkonenko would warm them up again and bring them back to life. The point of all this cruelty? To see how each individual organ in the body functions and reanimates life. However, as brutal and cruel as his experiments were, they marked a turning point in medical history and laid the foundation for life support technologies like heart-lung machines used in surgeries and critical care. Thank you.